Good evening, good afternoon, or good morning, whichever one applies to you. This is John Michael at Context is Everything Media Network, and another episode, episode five, of our daily dive into world history circa 2001. Now, this is a book published in 2001. I'm realizing how much this color scheme, I like this color scheme, the, the orange into the sky blue. Um, I notice that it's the same as that. I also notice it's the same as that. I also notice that it's the same as that guitar. Which would be a sunburst. Uh, these are things that I did not coordinate. And I just realized that I like it. Also, my screen background on this computer. If I could do a screen share right now, which I don't know how to do immediately, since this is on a, just the simple camera app on a Windows 10, or whatever is after that, 11? Uh, yeah, that same blue gradient to orange, and so on. A lot of that. One, two, three, screen background, four, five. Coincidence? No, I think I like it. I think I like those colors. All right, enough of that. That's not what I'm here to talk about. I'm here to talk about world history circa 2001. Last time there was a question, and the question was, what was the question? Describe three achievements of ancient Egyptians in the arts and learning. Well, I'll tell you three, but the book is probably going to have three as well. So I should uh, look at those, see what they are. It's pretty easy to find these answers, really. If you just want to talk about strategy, of textbook strategy, I mean, I never really saw the purpose of reading the textbook through the times that I did do my history homework. And also, sorry about the wrinkled shirt. I'm realizing this is bad look on camera. And I'll work on it. But not today. Maybe later I'll work on it, but I'm not going to reshoot. One take. One take, Tony. But this is John Michael Context is Everything Media Network. Welcome. Um, this is talking about 2001 history book. Why? That's what I had. It also matches the color scheme that I was talking about earlier. Um, so the question is, describe three achievements of ancient Egyptians in arts and learning. Oh, I mean, there's a subheading right here. Paintings and sculpture. I think that's going to have something to do with arts. It's like, why would I read the textbook through? I can just look at the questions at the end and make it very explicit, very easy in that sense. Which I guess is fine, but it's not difficult. I guess that's the point. It's more tedious. It's just routine. It's fine. It doesn't bother me. Painting and sculpture. The arts of ancient Egypt included statues, wall paintings and tombs, carvings on temples. Some show everyday scenes of trade, farming, family life, or religious ceremonies. Others boast of victories in battle. Painting styles remained almost unchanged. For thousands of years, the pharaohs and gods were always much larger than other human figures. Artists usually drew people with their heads and limbs in profile, but their eyes and shoulders facing the viewer think this guy, right? Egyptian, this guy, right? He's gonna be like that, but his legs are gonna be like that. <laughs> Statues often depicted people in stiff, Standard poses. Some human figures have animal heads that represent special qualities. The great sphinx that crouches near the pyramids of Giza portrays an early pharaoh and a powerful lion. So these aren't really like so artistic achievements. Um, did they build the sphinx, the Egyptians? I think that that is actually in question. So I don't know if I can give them that as a major artistic achievement. you got to give them the pyramids, artistic achievement. That's probably the best artistic achievement 
in human history, uh, unless there was other species involved in the building of the pyramids, which is possible. I don't know. I wasn't there. Just seems like we didn't build ramps. The ramps would have been bigger than the pyramid. We should have kept the ramps up. They were a feat of human ingenuity. The ramps would have been better. Just don't even build the pyramid. Just build the ramps. Um, yeah, so pyramids for sure. Definitely a big artistic achievement. Um, medicine and science. I didn't really look at this yet. So uh, we're going to give them the pyramids. And we're going to give them... Another artistic achievement, you know, just painting style, like the hieroglyphics, those are art. Pictograms, you know. Advances in medical or medicine and science. Let's see what they have to say here. The ancient Egyptians accumulated a vast store of knowledge in fields such as medicine, astronomy, and mathematics. They were practical people. When they had a problem, they used trial and error to find the solution. Like most doctors, until recent times, Egyptian physicians believed in various kinds of magic. Yet through their knowledge of mummification, they learned a lot about the human body. They also became skilled at observing symptoms, diagnosing illnesses, and finding cures. Doctors performed complex surgical operations, which... They described on papyrus scrolls, those papyrus scrolls, which may have been burnt in one of the most horrendous calamities in human history, the burning of the Library of Alexandria. Let me tell you, I'm not a fan of that. I think we could have really done with that ancient wisdom. But that's for another chapter. So what are they telling you here? What are their innovations? They believed in magic, and they were good at diagnosing illnesses. I'm gonna give. I'm gonna just put that in. I'm gonna put that in. Good at diagnosing illnesses. That's one of their medical benefits. That is, that's shown that they're good at it, right? All right. That's enough of that. On to the next chapter. So, all in all, so far, the Egyptians, great guys. That's my big takeaway so far through sections one and two. And I say I don't say that in jest. It's a chair. Um, so here we are. Next section. So this is section three. Um, again, when I look over here, this is me looking at myself because I'm very self-involved. And when I'm looking over here, this is me looking at you because I'm talking to the listener. Section 3. City-states of ancient Sumer. Sumer? Hierarchy, vocabulary word, zugrat, ziggurat, and cuneiform. I remember a few of those words except for ziggurat. Hierarchy is a word that I think is a nice sounding word, but obviously has some Grim implications. Setting the scene. Why do you idle about? Go to school and recite your assignments. After you have finished, come to me. Do not wander about the streets. Now. Do you know what I said? Almost 4,000 years ago, a father wrote these words to his son, who was studying to become a scribe. He then made his son uh, copy the instructions so he would not forget them. The father and son lived in Sumer, a region between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. The cities of Sumer lay to the northeast of the Nile in what we today call the Middle East. As builders of the earliest known civilization, the Sumerians made a lasting contribution to the world. So what what they're just giving you a little letter. The letter 
Are they, is that going to come back around? The letter didn't seem to really have much to do with it. I also might have just stopped listening to myself halfway through that, and it could have been completely connected. Now, a scribe. Let's just talk a little bit about Greek and Latin roots in our English language. Scribe. Latin roots are going to be very visible in Romance languages. Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, French. Maybe not Portuguese. I don't know anything about that language. Very, very confusing language to me. Don't know anything about it. Um, but definitely in Spanish, Italian, and French, Latin roots are very evident. So in English, just the pronunciation is so much different, so altered from our accent and from the way that the English language is pronounced that it doesn't really seem to be quite as connected to the uh, original Latin word that we use in our English language. Uh, but there's some words that slip through the cracks, and this one is one of them. So almost 4,000 years ago, a father wrote these words to his son who was studying to become a scribe. So what's a scribe do? A scribe would write stuff down. Now, when you think about that, and you think about Romance languages, Latin, based languages and think of the word write you're going to see where this word scribe comes from so what's the word write in Spanish like write that's right escribir scribe one who scribes Latin roots maybe a Greek root I don't know I'm going to guess Latin because it's similar in Spanish all right what are we even talking about? Sumer, Sumer, which is in the Fertile Crescent, which is what we're going to talk about now. We only have about six minutes left, so we're really going to get a little bit into this. I'm starting to take my time. i got to move through these pages faster, right? Leave in the comments below if I should move through these pages faster or dilly-dally. Because the goal is to get through this book, which is 1,007 pages long. And I'm on 34. Geography of the Fertile Crescent. If you look at the map on the next page, you will notice... Okay, we're talking about the map on the next page. I'm not showing the map. I guess I'll just show the map. <sighs> Nomadic quarters. Land between the rivers. Okay, let's just get to it. Nomadic herders in the Fertile Crescent, which is the place where Sumer is, which is between the Tigris and the Euphrates, which is important because those rivers bring life to northern Africa, where otherwise it would be desolate, desert, and uninhabitable, at least on mass scales. So the Fertile Crescent, very important, because it's a crescent of land that is fertile due to water and soil and sunlight and oxygen and seeds and seedlings and organized agriculture and all that. And silt carried from the big floods of whatever month. Fertile Crescent, important, inhabitable, thus civilization, yada yada yada. Nomadic herders, ambitious invaders and traders easily overcame few natural barriers across the Fertile Crescent. As a result, the region became a crossroads where people and ideas met and mingled. Each new group that arrived made its own contributions to the turbulent history of the region. Turbulent history of the region. The land between the rivers. The first known civilization in the Fertile Crescent was uncovered in the 1800s in Mesopotamia. The Tigris and Euphrates rivers define Mesopotamia which means between the rivers in Greek. Does it? Two rivers flow from the highlands of modern-day Turkey through Iraq into the Persian Gulf. In Sumer, as in Egypt, the fertile land of a river valley attracted Stone Age farmers from neighboring regions. In time, their descendants produced the surplus food needed to supply growing populations. 
floods and irrigation. Should I keep going? You get the idea, right? Floods and irrigation. Just as a control of the Nile was vital to Egypt, control of the Tigris and Euphrates was key to developing Mesopotamia. The rivers frequently rose in terrifying floods that washed away topsoil and destroyed mud brick villages. One story in the long Sumerian narrative poem, The Epic of Gilgamesh, tells of a great flood that destroyed the world. Archaeologists have indeed found evidence that a catastrophic flood devastated the Fertile Crescent some 4,900 years ago. And it's kind of interesting because that somewhat overlaps with the uh, what is often thought of as a myth, and it could be the myth of Noah's Ark. Uh, so they might be talking about the same flood. Isn't that interesting? It might actually be a true story. I don't know. It might be. I might be dead wrong. But I wasn't there, so I can't really say for certain. Uh, let's see. To survive and protect their farmland, villages along the riverbank had to work together. Even during the dry season, the rivers had to be controlled to channel water to the fields. Temple priests, royal officials provided leadership that was necessary to ensure cooperation the organized, uh, they organized villagers to build dikes and hold back floodwaters and irrigation ditches to carry water to the fields. The first cities. I think that we're going to get to the cities because I'm just making an educated guess here. You talked about irrigation, channeling water elsewhere. And once you can do that, you can be like, well, we're getting water over here, which didn't have water before. And we're going to say, let's make this useful city right there because they planned it with irrigation. That's my guess that we're going to talk about a city that was formed because of irrigation technology. First cities, around 3200 BC, the first Sumerian cities emerged in the southern part of Mesopotamia. The Sumerians had few natural resources, but they made the most of what they had. They lacked building materials such as timber or stone, so they built with earth and water. They made bricks of clay shaped in wooden molds and dried in the sun. These bricks were building blocks for great cities like Ur and Erich. Trade brought riches to Sumerian cities. Traders sailed along the rivers and risked the dangers of desert travel to carry goods to distant regions. Although the wheel had been invented by some uh, earlier unknown people, the Sumerians made the first wheeled vehicles. Huh. Archaeologists have found goods from as far away as Egypt and India in the rubble of Sumerian cities. Oh, so they, uh, they, were, they were drawing a crowd. We got about a minute 17 left before the bell. So I'm gonna see if there's a question that I can ask here, because these uh, fertile crescents in these river valleys are uh, pretty important, pretty interesting at some level. So why don't we uh, ask a question about that, because I'm seeing one right here. A series of early civilizations rose in the land between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. Location, place, critical thinking. Let's look at the critical thinking. How about that? All right. Critical thinking. Comparing. Review the map of the Egyptian Empire in section one. I mean, just look one up. The Egyptian Empire. Um, compare the location, physical features and extent of the Egyptian and Babylonian empires. What? Review the map of the Egyptian empire in section one. Compare the location, physical features, and extent of the Egyptian and Babylonian empires. I don't like it. How about this? Look for uh, something to do with the Fertile Crescent. That's it. All of us here at Context is Everything Media Network would like to thank you for sticking around for this show. This is What's Under Your Hood, Episode 5. 
I don't know what it's called yet. 